A cyber attack targeting America's electricity grid could be catastrophic, plunging most of North America into blackout, potentially for months. Veteran journalist Ted Koppel investigates just such a possible disaster in his new book. It's called Lights Out, A Cyber Attack, A Nation Unprepared, Surviving the Aftermath. And Ted Koppel joins us now from Washington, D.C. And I am going to do my very best not to call you Mr. Koppel, as you insisted before we went on air, but it's very hard for me to call you Ted, but I shall try. Welcome to our program anyway. That's very kind of you, and I'll try very hard to say lights, lights out instead of lights out. <laughs> we'll make a Canadian out of you yet. Let's that, just, to put, us, well, uh, I... to put us all in the right mood for this conversation, let's take a look at a clip. This is from the 2013 National Geographic film called American Blackout. Let's roll it, please, Sheldon. What the hell? Reports are coming in of a massive grid failure that has taken power out along the east coast of the United States. I was in the middle of a shower, and all of a sudden, it went completely black. Gosh, it looks like there's lights off. I understand everyone would like to move, so would I. Mm -hmm. I have no time estimation also as to when we will be moving. The power's going out, so no internet, computer doesn't work. Nothing. So far, we have no confirmation on what is causing this devastating outage, but rumors of a cyber attack are already being mentioned by authorities. Come on. One, one more. more. There you yeah. go. Lily did it. Mommy, I'm scared. It's okay. We just lost power. Twitter is blowing up. I mean, exploding. There's reports of blackouts happening all over the East Coast. They're going to New York City. So I don't know. This thing might be bigger than I think it is. Ted, we remember well back in 2003 that about 10 million people here in the province of Ontario and 45 million Americans in the Northeast lost power because of that situation. Can you tell us the difference between what happened then and what you're writing about in your book? Yes, what happened then was a natural event. Apparently some power lines were brushed by tree branches and incredible as it seems, that caused a cascading outage which, as you say, resulted in millions of people, not only in the United States, the Northeastern US, but also in Canada, to be without power, as I recall, for about three days. Uh, I think uh, seven or eight people died. It cost billions uh, in lost revenue and, and uh, uh, expenses to both governments. And then the United States and Canada formed a joint commission uh, to figure out what had happened. And interestingly enough, one of the things, and remember now, this was 13 years ago, uh, one of the things that they concluded was that the, the power grid would be susceptible to a cyber attack. That was something that really no one had thought about back then, but they came to the conclusion that it could happen. And the difference between what happened in 2003 and the possibility of a cyber attack is that if someone is deliberately trying to take down the grid, they can keep on taking it down so that the likelihood of this taking out tens of millions of people in terms of their uh, electricity could last for as long as weeks or even months. We can show the impact that you're talking about with a little graphic right now. Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind bringing this up. This is a map of the four major power grids in North America, which very clearly illustrates how Canada might be affected even if there were a cyber attack on the United States alone. Now, depending on whether the attack were to be aimed at the west or the east, different parts of Canada would also be affected. Can you give us a sense of who you think would perpetrate, what foreign power presumably, would perpetrate such a cyber attack? Well, uh since you said which power would, it becomes a little more complex. Let me alter your question just ever so slightly by substituting the, the word could rather than would. The Russians could, the Chinese could, the Iranians possibly could, and the North Koreans uh, seem to be on the verge of acquiring the kind of cyber capabilities that perhaps they could. Those who could necessarily, however, are, are not the most likely to do it. 
Um, the interesting thing about uh, the cyber capabilities is that those who are most capable are least likely, and those who are least capable at the moment are most likely. What I mean by that is if ISIS ever got its hands uh, on the kind of cyber expertise to do this, they would be very likely to do it. They mercifully do not have that capability yet, but there are experts with whom I've spoken who believe that because they have a great deal of money, they can purchase the capability. Um, they are the most likely to do it. Those who have the greatest capability because of interlocking interests with the United States, people, I mean, the nations like Russia and uh, China, they are the least likely to do it, but they are already inside the grid. They definitely have the capability. I note a few years ago that your former defense secretary in the United States, Leon Panetta, warned that the U.S. could be a victim of what he called a cyber Pearl Harbor. President Obama, in his State of the Union a few years ago, also pointed this out. Did those speeches, in your view, make much of an impression on your country? No. I mean, <laughs> simply put, the answer is no. And that's one of the reasons that I decided to write this book. Uh, I, was, I was intrigued, and President Obama, as you correctly note, mentioned it not once, but actually twice in successive State of the Union addresses. But it was Leon Panetta's reference to a cyber Pearl Harbor. People of my generation, and Leon Panetta is of that generation, don't lightly use the term Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor sort of conjures up an image of absolute devastation. The likelihood that there could be a cyber Pearl Harbor in this country uh, intrigued me enough that I looked into it to see whether this really was something that could happen. Uh, the quick answer is yes, it could. Will it? All I can tell you is that the commander of CENTCOM, a uh, General Lloyd Austin, told me it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Well, let me use the nuclear parallel. Mutual assured destruction prevented, I guess in part, prevented a nuclear war for all of the years that the Soviet Union and the United States had that capability of destroying one another. Is there an equivalent MAD when it comes to the cyber world? Not really, and I'll explain why. Um, if, for example, the, the unthinkable had happened, and let's say for the sake of argument that Soviet missiles were launched against North America, against the United States. Um, the, the president's military advisors would have known about it within seconds of those rockets, those missiles leaving their launch pads. In the event of a cyber attack, one of the great problems is it can take weeks, if not months, before the, the origin of that cyber attack is, is traced. Um, if you can't say with, uh, with a definitive uh, uh, decision that a, uh, that a cyber attack has been launched, let's say, by the Chinese or by the Russians, the question is, against whom do you take action? And it can be weeks, as we discovered in the event of the, the North Korean cyber attack against Sony. There really was no doubt in anyone's mind that the North Koreans had done it. But it, it still took the FBI a matter of months before they could state with certainty that the attack had come from North Korea. Well, you do tell us in 250 pages, very well researched, very uh, enlightening pages, I might add, that uh, America is not ready for this. Are there other countries in the world that are better prepared to face a cyber attack? Um, I don't know, I mean, is the honest answer. I, I didn't really research what other countries have done. I think one of the problems is that the United States in particular uh, is especially vulnerable because of the deregulation of the electric power industry. Because of that deregulation, you have all kinds of different standards that exist within the, within the industry. We have some 3,200 electric power companies in this country. The biggest of them, the wealthiest of them, have, done, uh, have taken enormous preparations, security preparations, uh, to protect them and their customers uh, against the likelihood of a cyber attack. The smallest have not. The problem is all these companies, all 3,200 of them, are joined in a network so that if someone attacks one of the smallest, one of the weaker companies, they can, with the proper kind of 
uh, preparation work their way back through the system, thereby also attacking some of the larger ones. Let me read one of the quotes from your book. This is George Cotter, the former chief scientist at the NSA, who says, with adversaries malware in the national grid, the nation has little or no chance of withstanding a major attack. Uh, two questions emerging out of that. Number one, what's malware? And number two, why once when inserted, it's game over? Well, um, forgive me if I get a little bit wonky on you for a couple of minutes here, but those, those 3,200 companies that I was referencing just a moment ago, the, the supply of electricity, that is the amount of electricity that is generated, has to be precisely the same as the amount of electricity that is actually being used. I analogize it to a giant balloon with, let's say, a thousand different valves in that balloon. Uh, the amount of air coming in has to be exactly the same as the amount of air going out. Too much air going in, the balloon explodes. Too much air coming out, the balloon collapses. The same thing, if you can imagine it, with the electric power grid. What is controlling that balance is what is called a SCADA system, supervisory control and data acquisition. That is run by the internet. A couple of countries, as I mentioned previously, the Chinese and the Russians, are already inside that system. They have already planted their malware. Just consider mal as being bad and ware as being the necessary electronic, uh, electronic hardware to do damage inside the system. It's already in there. The Chinese have planted it, the Russians have planted it, the Iranians, I'm told, are close to having the capability of being able to do it. Uh, George Cotter is one of the smartest men on this subject alive today. He retired from the NSA some years ago, but he was the chief scientist, as you mentioned. Uh, when he says that they're already inside, I think you can take that as being gospel. Gospel, okay, and yet you, in dedicating this book to your seven grandchildren, add, here's hoping that Opie got it wrong. So let's ask you directly, um, given what you now know about this subject, over the next 10 years, what would you put the likelihood at that something like this will happen? Well, if, if I didn't think that it was likely, I wouldn't have written the book in the first place. Uh, I think over the, I mean, when you say over the next 10 years, I think it's all but inevitable that it's going to happen in the next 10 years. Well, something happened in Ukraine over the Christmas break, right? And this was not the yep. trees growing too tall kind of a power outage. This was an attack, was it not? We don't have to go as far as Ukraine. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you look at what the Chinese have done in terms of quite literally vacuuming up 22 million private records of U.S. government employees, as they have done, uh, it happens to be one of the greatest intelligence coups of all time. They were able to do that despite the fact that one would think that the CIA and the FBI and the State Department and the Defense Department uh, have fairly adequate protection against that kind of thing happening. Clearly not true. What you see in Ukraine uh, that just happened over the, over the Christmas holidays uh, is actually relatively minor at this point, but it gives you an indication of what can be done. The Russians in particular have been active in cyber warfare for some time. They took significant cyber actions against the state of Georgia uh, when they felt that Georgia was becoming a little bit too rambunctious. So the fact that it's now happening in Ukraine shouldn't surprise us at all. Cyber war is simply a part uh, of the landscape now, well, we unavoidable. Did, we did get a sense in that opening clip from the National Geographic documentary of what would happen in the aftermath of a cyber attack on the United States. But you go into considerably more detail in your book, and perhaps you can share some of that with us now. What would happen, in fact, if this did take place? Well, uh, you know, once you're without electricity, you are without the capability of, I mean, particularly if you live in an urban center, you're without the capability of heating or cooling your home. Uh, the, uh, the water supply is going to stop in the sense that it requires pumps, which are powered by electricity to get that water into the various apartment buildings, into the flats throughout the city. 
Uh, the worst part about that is not merely the fact that there wouldn't be enough drinking water available, but also the fact that you don't have the capability of disposing of human waste. Within the matter of just a few days, that becomes a major crisis. What was interesting to me about that National Geographic film, and actually it was very, very well done, but after, I think it was 10 or 12 days, they simply bring in one of the oldest theatrical devices, that is the deus ex machina, uh, the, the unexpected happening, and that is power is suddenly restored. Nobody explains why it was knocked out. Nobody explains how it was restored. It just is, and it does after 10 or 12 days. What's really frightening about the possibility of a cyber attack on the power grid is that the experts believe that the power could remain out for months. If it's out for months, no water, uh, no ability to dispose of human waste, no ability to cool or heat, um, no ability to, to uh, communicate. I mean, the fact of the matter is, yes, there are backup generators, but certainly not enough to take care of a city the size, let's say, of Montreal or Toronto. And if I read right in your book, there seems to be a dispute among people responsible for first response about whether or not to try to help people where they live or try to evacuate them. How have they resolved well, that issue? Uh uh, you're quite right, and they, to the best of my knowledge, they haven't resolved it. I spoke to the two top officials at FEMA. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It would be their responsibility to deal with the consequences uh, of an attack in the immediate aftermath. The, the deputy head of FEMA, who is a retired Coast Guard vice admiral, told me that, uh, in his opinion, uh, in the event that a city like New York or, or you know, the Manhattan was hit, uh, his response would be to evacuate. I said, evacuate eight million people? Well, he said, you don't leave me with much, uh, much of an option. If it happens, you're going to take care, you've got to take care of the people, and the only way I can see you could do that would be to evacuate. Uh, the next day I spoke to his boss and said, what would you do? Would you evacuate? And he said, evacuate? You can't evacuate 8 million people. Where would you put them? So uh, just to respond directly to your question, the two top people at the agency responsible for dealing with the consequences of an attack like this cannot agree on what they would do. Hmm. You describe an organization in this book, or I guess a movement is a better way to put it, called the Preppers. Who are the Preppers right. and what are they preparing for? Well, I'm sure that you have, I'm sure you have preppers in Canada as we do here in the United States. And, and essentially preppers are simply people who are prepared for bad things. Uh, it doesn't have to be, I mean, I, I talk to an awful lot of preppers. Uh, very few of them are actually preparing for a cyber attack on the grid. Some of them are preparing for what they think could be uh, an EMP, uh, which is essentially a nuclear attack in which a nuclear device is exploded over, let's say, the United States, knocking out all the electricity that way. Others are simply preparing for natural disasters, be those floods or blizzards or hurricanes, but they are folks who believe that in the event of a disaster happening, the government simply is not going to be able to take care of them for more than a couple of days. And so there are people who are trying to prepare for themselves. In a manner of speaking, their patron saint frequently uh, is considered to be Noah, uh, who I guess would have been history's first prepper. <laughs> Did you come to any conclusions yourself as to the reasonableness of this group? Um, I don't think there's anything unreasonable about being prepared for bad times. Um, I think, quite frankly, you can go, you can go a little bit nutsy, and, and some of these folks do. Um, but uh, to, to have an extra supply of food and water uh, to be able to take care of your family and to know uh, that you're not dependent upon government sort of running to the rescue, uh, I think that can actually be quite healthy. Well, having written the book, I should ask you directly, how prepared are you now? Uh, not as prepared as I should be, but I, I have bought some freeze-dried food for the family, for myself and my wife and uh, our children and our grandchildren. Uh, we do have a, a water supply and we do have backup generators. 
Uh, is that going to be sufficient? Um, I don't know. I, uh, I hope never to find out, but I fear that I may. Another quote from your book, it has never been more difficult to convince the American public of anything that it is not already inclined to believe. Why so? Right. Uh, we live in an era of uh, internet communications, in an era of uh, extremely partisan radio and television programs, and people seem inclined um, to believe only that which they are predisposed to believe. Uh, they pick those radio programs that uh, provide sort of an echo chamber to what they already believe so that the, the liberals are listening to extremely liberal radio hosts and television hosts and conservatives are doing uh, exactly the opposite. Um, and, and frankly, in an environment like that, it becomes very, very difficult to say to people, let's have a reasonable conversation. Mm -hmm. Reasonableness uh, has, is gradually being expunged from our political process. You have only to look at the American political scene these days. Well, since you've taken us there, let's go there. We've only got a few minutes left, and I can't have Ted Koppel here and not ask him about uh, the silly season that is American presidential politics. Who do you think on the Republican side poses the greatest challenge to Hillary Clinton's becoming the next president? Um, quite frankly, I don't think any of them do right now. Uh, but that's, let me put the emphasis on right now. I think as long as there are still nine or ten Republican candidates, uh, they are going to diffuse their, their capability of taking on uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, but, uh, you know, she, I think, is going to have a fairly easy ride to the nomination, uh, and the Republicans are going to be beating each other up for the next couple of months. Um, until the time that we see who the candidate is going to be, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I can't tell you at this point. I would have predicted that uh, Donald Trump, for example, would have been out, the, out of the race a long time ago. I was flat wrong. Hmm. I, I presume you've interviewed him or met him or know him reasonably well, given, uh, given the circles you two both travel in. What do you make of this whole phenomenon? Um, well, <laughs> H. L. Mencken, the great Baltimore journalist, at one point said, nobody ever went broke underestimating the good taste of the American public. <laughs> uh, I think we're seeing an example of that right now. Hmm. I do remember, let me ask you about another great American institution, and that's, um, that's an institution that you said, having been born overseas, not in America, that until you understood it, you could never really fully feel 100% American. And that's baseball, Ted Koppel. Do you know any more or have any greater appreciation of baseball today than you did, say, when you were doing Nightline? Let me put it this way. I used to think that cricket was the most boring game in the world. <laughs> I've revised my opinion. Oh, my gosh. Ted Koppel, that is a very disappointing thing for you to say, but, <laughs> but I'll let you get away with it. Um, let me just say in our last minute here, uh, and I, I guess you hear this all the time, so I apologize in advance, but... When you signed on with uh, Nightline all those years ago, I think I was about 18 or 19 years old, and I watched it every night. And I think one of the reasons I'm sitting in this chair here tonight is because of guys, well, not guys like you, is because of you. So thank you for your fantastic career, and I enjoyed the book very much, and we're really grateful you spared so much time for us tonight here on TVO. Well, that's, that's a very generous statement for you to make. Uh, and to those of your fans, I'm happy to take credit. And uh, to those who think of you otherwise, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> you sound like my mother. She says that all the time, too. Uh, the yeah. name of the book is Lights Out, A Cyber Attack, A Nation Unprepared, Surviving the Aftermath. Ted Koppel, so good to have you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. I enjoyed it. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.